Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so here we go. Luke chapter 21, and here's what it says. And he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, truly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all for all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God. But she out of her poverty put in all the livelihood that she had. Well, first, let me mention that it says in Jesus, let me go back here to the first verse. It says, and he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury and he saw a certain poor widow. So Jesus is watching people give their offerings. Let me tell you, he still watches people give their tithes and offerings today. And he knows that to some people, what they're giving, how much they're giving, is not a sacrifice at all because they have plenty every month. They're not hurting. But he also knows that there are other people who, oh, they are barely scraping by and maybe way behind on their bills a single mother trying to care for multiple children and such, uh, and maybe a sick relative. And, uh, and he notices who sacrifices and who doesn't sacrifice. When an opportunity to give toward missions or to give toward another need or to help somebody in need, and the people that have plenty, they kind of act like they didn't hear it. And such, and yet the person that's so tight says, "I gotta, I gotta try to help." Boy, I tell you, God notices, and Jesus was watching, and He didn't turn the other way to say, "Well, I don't want to look at what people are doing." No, He wanted to look, not to be nosy, but He wanted to see how people were giving and what, with what kind of heart they were giving. And so He said, even though this lady, in amount, gave the least two mites like maybe a penny worth of giving. He said, but that's all she had. She didn't have anything else to give. She gave 100% of what she had. Where these other people may have been giving as many, let's just say $10,000 or whatever, but it was a drop in the bucket to what they really had. See, and so Jesus said, yep, based on the kingdom of God standards, <laughs> she gave more than all of them, because she gave everything. Verse 5, Then, as some spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and donations, he said, These things which you see, the days will come, uh, in which not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Talking about not one stone of the temple. I know that you can go to Jerusalem today, and when you get uh, over by the Temple Mount on the, let's see, on the west side of the Temple Mount, uh, you know there there are some retaining walls that King Herod built, King Herod the Great built, uh, and put a big platform up there on the Temple Mount to level it out because you know how a mountain shaped. Well, he put a big platform there and backfilled it with dirt and so on. And then the Temple of Herod, they call it the Second Temple because it's acknowledged as a a great embellishment of Zerubbabel's temple. But because uh, the Jews don't accept that the Romans built the second temple. But nonetheless, it was a pretty much a complete redo. But um, so when you go on the west side of the retaining wall and just, just a little south from the wailing wall, the western wall where so many people go to worship, there is this massive pile of stones now, likely they're not temple stones because it was farther south than where the temple would likely be. But potentially they're, they're um, temple stones. But I'd say more than likely they're part of the portico or 
some of the other structure that was up there on the Temple Mount. But nonetheless, they give you a picture of exactly what Jesus said. He said, do you see these stones? He said, the time's coming when not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Thrown down where? Thrown down off of the Temple Mount, over the side of the retaining wall, down. And these, this particular pile of stones, they crushed the pavement that was down there, where there was a marketplace down there. They crushed the pavement. And this is the doings of, of the Romans. Uh, the doing of the Romans in A.D. 70 when the temple was destroyed. So Jesus is predicting this some 40 years before it actually took place. Okay, number seven. So they asked him, saying, Teacher, but when will these things be, and what will be the sign, uh, or what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? And he said, Take heed that you be not deceived, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time has drawn near. Therefore, do not go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. Seems to me, and I can't say for sure, but it seems to me like when Jesus is saying, you're going to hear of wars and commotions, rumors of wars, but the end won't quite be yet that this could be the world wars that happened in the early part and uh, the, you know, almost middle part of the 20th century. But he didn't come back quite yet, did he? But he said it, it will not be immediately, it will not come immediately. Verse 10, then he said, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences. Well, we're experiencing a lot of those now, aren't we? And there will be fearful sights and great signs in the heaven. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. But it will turn out for you as an occasion for a testimony. Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. So he said, don't come up with a speech. Don't come up with a script of what you're going to say. He goes on to say in verse 15, For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. You will, betray, you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your patience you shall possess your souls. Possessing your soul, I believe, includes self-control, keeping a hold of your emotions, not just blurting out anything you want to say in anger, or frustration, or whatever. Verse 20, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, and this is what they were asking about when he said, not one stone of the temple will be left upon another that will not be thrown down. He said, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. This is very interesting and, and very important in the timeline of eschatology that uh, from Daniel's prophecy when he said from the time the decree is made until Messiah the Prince will be, you can go back and read it, I think in the ninth chapter of Daniel, will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So that was 69 weeks. The week is, is really a seven-year period. It's not seven days, but seven years. So 69 seven-year periods. But God had told Daniel, there is a 70th week. There are 70 seven-year periods that are determined for your people, the Jews, and for your holy city, which is Jerusalem. 
And so he said, 69 of those seven-year periods are going to tick off until Messiah, the prince, comes. That's when Jesus came the first time. But there's still this one seven-year period that's left. So it's like God, you know, hit the stopwatch when the decree was made to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, tick, 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 and 69 seven-year periods ticked off, and Jesus comes riding in on the donkey, you know, click, right as the 69th seven-year period concluded, and the stopwatch stopped, and from that point on, Jesus was killed, raised from the dead, and then the times of the Gentiles began. And so this is where the gospel is being spread all over the world, outside of Israel, by and large, Israel, the Jewish people, have not yet received the gospel of Jesus Christ, have not yet acknowledged Jesus as their Messiah, Yeshua as their Messiah. And so Jesus is saying that, look, this is going to be surrounded by Gentiles, the Romans, who are going to you know, trample this city, and it's going to be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. This is going to be at the end of the age, and when the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, that stopwatch will click on again, and the last seven-year period that we know as the tribulation period will ensue, and of course, the tribulation period, book of Revelation, that all centers around Israel and Jerusalem. So it's back to the times of the Jewish people, and it's surrounding their holy city. Okay, so verse 25, And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on earth distress of nations with perplexities, the sea and the waves roaring. Do you remember the big tsunami that hit you know, South Asia and other parts of uh, that area over there that just killed 100,000 people or more. Verse 26, men's hearts failing, uh, failing them for fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. They will see. They will see. Jesus is not going to show up. Uh, silently or incognito like he did as a baby in Bethlehem. Uh-uh. When he comes back the second time, everybody will see him. Verse 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Then he spoke to them. So notice he said, when these things begin to happen, not when Jesus comes. No, it's too late if you're waiting until then. But when these signs leading up to his coming begin to happen, he said, lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Then he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees when they are already budding and you see and know for yourself that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Well, let me just stop for a minute here because it's possible. It's possible in a couple of places. One in Hosea, I'm thinking another one might be in Jeremiah, where God calls Israel his fig tree. And here Jesus is giving a parable of a fig tree, and he says, when you see the fig tree budding, when you see it putting forth leaves and budding, Matthew 24 says something to that effect. He said, you'll know that summer is near. What's summer? This is the time for the harvest, right? So he said, you'll know that summer is near. And then he goes on to say, uh, this generation will not pass away till all things are fulfilled. Well, if, if, and I say if because this is not clear in the scriptures that I've seen, but it could be. You know, May 14th, 1948 is when Israel became a nation again after nearly 2,000 years of the Jewish people being scattered all over the world. And here at the end of the age, after nearly 2,000 years, remember the times of the Gentiles, right? Here, now Israel becomes a nation again, declares its independence. Well, if that time, May 14th, 1948, was the budding of the fig tree of God, Israel, and this generation will not pass away till all these things uh, be fulfilled, well, you can calculate how many years it's been since 1948, and just think 
if that a person was born in 1948, May of 1948, how old would that person be now? And if this is indeed a sign that Jesus is giving us about the reconstitution of the nation of Israel, and he says, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things be fulfilled, including, he said, the coming of the Son of Man. Uh, well, you can see right then, we must be getting close if that is a proper application. So I'm not saying dogmatically it is, but I'm saying it very well could be. We have no reason to not believe that it is because we haven't passed. Like if it was 200 years or even 150 years past or even 120 years past the May 14, 1948 date, well, you would say, look, that generation has passed away. But right now it hasn't passed away. These folks that were born, in fact, I have a good friend that was born on that day who lives in Israel. And uh, well, he hadn't passed away. He's still there and he's, you know, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, verse 34. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life. And the day, capital D, the day, that's the day of the Lord, the day that Jesus comes back. The day, that day come upon you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Oh, let's take heed. Jesus is not giving these warnings lightly. We should not take them lightly. We should pay attention. Jesus is warning us. Don't you get caught up with party life, drunkenness, just doing your own thing. We need to be about the Father's business. Verse 37, and in the daytime he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and stayed on the mountain called Olivet. Then early in the morning all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. So when it says he stayed on the mountain called Olivet, I can just picture this in my mind, the temple mount here uh, coming down to the Kidron Valley and up the slope of the Mount of Olives, or Olivet as it sometimes says. But where Jesus would stay was over the peak of the Mount of Olives. And on the back side of the Mount of Olives were the little towns of Bethany and Bethphage. And Jesus would stay over there sometimes, if not all the time, with uh, the household of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, who were siblings. And so he would stay with them at least some of the time. All right. Well, that's it for chapter 21. That was the parallel chapter to Matthew chapter 24, that great eschat eschatological chapter. And so uh, Luke is a little bit of a pared down version of Matthew 24, but Luke brings a few details that Matthew does not cover. So thank God we have the gospel of Luke as well. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow for chapter 22.